Um, we've got about 11 people here in the waiting room. I'll start letting them in now. Okay. And um, what I'll do is oh, I'll start letting them in now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shall I bring All myself right. a bit closer? So while uh, we just let people start to join, what might be a good idea if we do something... Um, Maybe for the people that haven't met you yet, just a little bit of a background of yourself, history, the kind of stuff that went into that little bio that you did for me. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Adrian, and officially I'm a full-time teacher of the Alexander Technique. I just happen to play guitar for fun as well. And seeing as I enjoy both, it makes sense to tie the two together. So that's what I've done. And it's very common the Alexander Technique to be tied with musicians. It's actually kind of often associated with the two. Um, unfairly or not, it, it's great for us musicians anyway that it's there for us. So I started out playing guitar when I was ooh, 17, having got a guitar when I was about 14, a classical guitar, which um, I didn't know how to tune. There was no internet. Um, well, actually, there was. It was 1983. No one had access to it. It was physically existing. <laughs> didn't count for much. And, uh, you know, you, I don't know if you've seen Pass It has no spread markers on it or anything. And I didn't know how to tune it. And I just looked at it like, oh, what the heck? And up in the attic it went. And there it stayed three years until a friend complained to me that the guitar his parents had bought him was really rubbish. I said, don't worry. I'm going to borrow it. So he comes over, we go up into the attic, and uh, he tunes it up, plays an E chord. How'd you do that? And he shows me, and I go, you can't borrow it. <laughs> the bug was right there. I think by 17, you know, I was just getting to rock music and stuff, and I thought, yeah, no, this, this will be fun. And I started off the classical music lessons for a year at school. Um, and I carried on that while, a while, for a few years actually, after I left, I carried on playing classical alongside playing electric guitar. And then at college, guitar players were to a penny, <laughs> and there weren't many bass players. So uh, I was invited by some of the friends to play bass, and in fairness, um, their guitar player, our friend Kel, he, he was so awesome. I'd been embarrassed to play guitar next to him at the time. He'd been playing a lot longer. I was quite happy to support him on bass. And I had actually had a real love for bass anyway. Um, you know, I, I was getting into Rush and, and Led Zeppelin. And, you know, you, you support the choice, whether you're a guitar player or, or a bass player. With those bands, you know, it's a win-win either way. So um, I was playing bass for a few years. I still play guitar. Um, and I didn't notice... In those bass playing days, I was quite tense, I think. And I don't think I recognised it myself, but I would get very tired hands after rehearsal or a gig. And we used to gig about twice a week consistently for about you know, a year or two, um, and then all the rehearsals in between. And then you know, I'd be there going, oh, God, my hands. <laughs> I was lucky, though. It never actually led to injury at the time. And... Uh, Go forward a few years, um, I was about to so those were college bands, and I was just about to um, graduate in electronic engineering, mostly. Um, and, and there's electronic engineering with, a, with some music technology and audio thrown in as well. It's quite an interesting course. But just as I'm about to graduate, I actually had my first proper play injury. And, uh, I went to do an Albert Style King two-tone bend on a strap with um, a fender scale length, tuned, standard tuning with 11s. And I used to play 11s a lot in those days, um, partially from playing bass a lot. Um, the strings just didn't cut out. If there's any bass players out there, you know what it's like going from bass to guitar. It, it, it seems hard to control the strings. Um, and also, you know, the obvious Steve Ray Vaughan. <laughs> um, and suddenly just snap, I felt this ping in my elbow. And it just really hurt. <laughs> and I thought, no, oh, it'll pass. I'll just stop playing for a couple of weeks. But it didn't. Every time I tried to play, it would come back, particularly with string bending. And luckily, you know, 
I was just about to graduate. I was thinking I was, li I was living in Leeds at the time, where you went to music college, Lou, which was great. I, Leeds is such a great music city. I, I really fell in love listening to jazz while I was there because there's jazz musicians, you know, everywhere. Well, jazz students just play free gigs everywhere all the time. Um, that's when I first started getting into jazz. Uh, well, no, that's not entirely true. I had gone to West Montgomery a bit before because I, I did the typical guitarist. Well, I don't know if it's typical, but I fell in love with guitar as a whole, not just music. So I would buy, you know, stuff by all, all the greats through history, starting from sort of like you know, Django Reinhardt and um, um, who's the obvious blues guy? Robert Johnson. So I checked out a bit of jazz, but this is where I really picked it up. I love it. And I didn't know what to do about my arm. And doctors were saying, there's nothing wrong with your elbow. We can't find anything wrong with your elbow. Physio couldn't find anything wrong with my elbow. So well, of course, thought... actually, this might be a little uh, good point for me to just get in here with the people watching. Um, this is going to be one of the subjects of today's injury and pain. Just to get you, um, well, to bring you guys into this a little bit. If you guys on Zoom or YouTube can just let us know if you're suffering with any, any injuries, RSI, things like that, just so we can, uh, we might reference those things later so we can, we can keep it cool. relevant. Cool. Back to you. So, yeah, the physio doctors complained, nothing wrong with my elbow. And I thought, oh, well, that's a pain. But I didn't want to give up the guitar. But at least I had no commitments, band commitments, because I was going to move to London. I'm still here. I thought, well, what can I do instead? So I bought um, an Epiphone Emperor Joe Pass, which you have, which is why I made a beeline for it when I saw it in the corner of the flat. Because <laughs> uh, it was a long time since I'd seen one. Because um, I was figured if I just don't do any string bending, I'll get, you know, I'll cope. Um, and I kind of coped a bit, but I generally found I couldn't play for much longer than half an hour. And that kind of stayed that way for about nearly four years. And I'd go through phases where I'd stay not touch the guitar at all for months. But my job in IT led to its own issues, RSI, et cetera, upper back pain, being sat in front of the computer in a quite a high stress environment it was uh, investment banks and stockbrokers so it's quite a hasty kind of environment and i started seeing you know chiropractors and osteopaths and physios what have you, you know, quite regularly to help with that and quite early on someone manipulated my neck as they do and i felt something change in my elbow and i suddenly realized i didn't have an elbow <laughs> I had a neck problem, and the nerves that fed my elbow from my neck were being impinged. I thought, fantastic, I can get back to it, I'm cured. But I wasn't. Because <laughs> what happened was, when I got back to playing, I kept redoing it. I thought, what the heck am I doing? I'm doing something to myself. The guitar's not doing it to me, I'm doing it. And I didn't know what it was. Um, I think I was far more ignorant then than I, I actually realized now, because so much I, I know now I take for granted, but I, I think I really was utterly clueless at the time about many of these things, and I think many of us are. But chance would have it, um, I don't know, I can't remember how I found out, but uh, legend, who is Sean Baxter. <laughs> You're not familiar with Sean, us in the UK. Um, when The last time when you interviewed Sean, by the way, Luke, you said so many of us bought that magazine just for his column. I thought, I can't believe you just said that. I thought it was just me. <laughs> Sean wrote uh, an article, a monthly column, in a well-known guitar techniques magazine. That's his title, guitar techniques. Um, and yeah, I would literally buy that magazine for his monthly column. So I end up with a pile of them up here that you can wade your way through. There's too much information in the end. I had to sort of get rid of them. <laughs> but somehow I found out that he gave lessons in I can't remember how to spray, but let's just say ergonomics. So I went for a one-off lesson with him down in Acton, as I remember, where the uh, oh, was it Guitar X at the time or whatever it was that it was called at the time, Guitar Institute maybe. And he spotted it like straight away what I was doing. I mean, I think it was a half-hour session, and within five minutes we were done. Like, what we're going to do in the other twenty-five minutes? And basically, the my main problem was every time I went to bend a string. Um, I would hoik my elbow up and probably pull my neck over a bit. So it's kind of like, uh, and I think a lot of that goes to not just because I was an actually tense person, put too much effort into it. I think many of us see some of our favorite players and those facial expressions they do. I think I 
literally bought into those facial expressions thinking, that's effort. So I've got to make the same effort. Now, when Bieber King pulls that face, <laughs> you think, that's effort. Or, at least I did. And I think that's not uncommon, to be honest, to take that visual behavior and misinterpret it. So Sean got me on the straight and narrow pretty quick, actually. And then I could get back to practicing. It was great. And uh, I did get back into it. And although I never joined a band again, I mean, it's kind of a funny old place for joining bands if, if you're not young. I mean, I was in my 30s by then. I just wanted to play a few pub gigs. And I was considered not serious enough. <laughs> like, what do you mean serious? <laughs> we all got stage jobs. I, I was quite happy just doing the pub gig thing. Instead, what I did was I did the... the um, the Blues Jam thing instead, which was great because there's no commitment. You know, I've got a great job and I just had nothing to do that. I loved it. It was great. There's some songwriting with a friend as well with a view to doing some open mics, some original material. Um, unfortunately, his job, Goldman Sachs, sent him to New York, so that never, never actually happened. We had the songs, but we never got around to performing them. But then I was getting worse and worse with my RSI from computer-related work. And I wasn't seeing a solution from that. And to be honest, it wasn't overly affecting my guitar playing. But that's because I think I developed a style of playing that could accommodate being quite tense, which is why I, I stuck with the 11 chase strings, because, you know, you can muscle your way through it. There's no finesse. Um, and it kind of hit that, to be honest. It's funny, but surely things got a bit worse until I was boring someone stupid at a party about my aches and pains. As you do. Poor girl, I, I don't know what made me think of <laughs> moaning to her about my <laughs> aches and pains. She was a ballet dancer, as it happens. I just had it. Had you heard of the Alex Sunset? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. But it sounded interesting, what she was saying. Um, and interesting enough for me to Google it the following day. I assume it was Google. It's long enough ago. It could have been one of the other search engines. Oh, and I wish I could remember. Yeah, maybe. I was never much an RSP person, actually. It was Metacrawler. It could have been Metacrawler, I assume. Um, whoever's website I found, I wish I knew who it was. Because they'd written something so clearly that it was just like a, a light bulb moment. That this is stuff I'm doing to myself. This is my own behavior. So not only do I have a solution because I can change my own behavior through, obviously, the help of the anxiety which has been shown. What I particularly liked was the fact that it self-empowered me. I wasn't being therapized or wasn't being fixed by someone else. I was gaining self-empowerment to have more agency over myself. And that was just a message that suited me. I mean, it's not a message that suits everyone. Some people like to be fixed by other people. I, you know, we're all different, but it's logical if you realize you're, I mean, I, I say this, um, this phrase um, loosely because I know it has an obvious, um, more serious connotation, but I was self-harming and I recognized that. And if you can recognize that, you know you have to be involved in the process to stop it. You know, no one else can stop you doing that from a logical point of view. Well, there's Very also the other side of it, which is in this method, you're addressing the problem uh, you're addressing the cause and not just the yeah. like outcome of the problem. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And and that was just so obvious to me at the time. Um, I was like, oh wow, this is it. Well, at least I've definitely I haven't gone to the first lesson yet. <laughs> but luckily, so, I found some some around the corner. Literally, I I, I mean, lo I'm really lucky where I live in North London. I mean, there's loads of like, out of teachers around. So I went for my first lesson. I was like, wow, this this is it. Um, I absolutely love my lessons. And I did so surely start addressing my guitar playing with it as well. But I wasn't that guitar focused at the time. It was still, you know, just had a day job and all. And I didn't have any serious problems to solve with the guitar. It was more I could play a bit better, I could perform better. Um, so I sort of chipped away at it. And I was really enjoying it. I ended up actually writing a website while I was still working in IT called Guitar Freedom about what I, 
I could make of my Alexander lessons from and how I could apply them to the guitar. Um, I'm not sure what happens to that one. <laughs> I guess I had a friend do all the graphics for me. Uh, and I, I, I thought I'd download it. I, I took it offline eventually, but I thought I'd downloaded it somewhere and I've lost it. I thought I had a, an offline copy, but it's gone. <laughs> Um, but eventually, you know, a, a series of un unfortunate events, Lemony Snicket, uh, <laughs> my daughter's watching at the moment, a series of unfortunate events. I lost my job in the city through the 2008 credit crunch. And through some other events as well, I won't go into it right now, um, I decided to just go for it. Because I was completely falling in love with the other ones, actually. And I had in the back of my mind said, I would like at a later date have a career doing that as a second career. I was kind of assuming not to do it for 15 more years, just keep working in the city. But after I lost my job, a few other odds and ends, I was in a position I thought, just do it now. Just do it now. So I became a full time student again. And uh, uh, that course was just incredible. A I mean, in terms of, of life improvement, self-discovery just incredible the interesting thing was i again I, I was kind of i was absolutely benefiting from my alexander lessons and journey from a guitar perspective but they were kind of a byproduct really just i wasn't really really focused on it you know, i'm just uh, letting it kind of help and in my final year um i actually made a decision to stop playing altogether um, partly because my first daughter was just born and I wanted to focus on that. <laughs> and partly one of my friends, Claire, who was, uh, she's a cello player. Um, she decided to stop playing for her final year so that when she went back to it, she could really start with a clean slate or as clean a slate as possible from an Alexander perspective. See if we can really let go of some of the habits and associations we have with our instruments to start fresh. I thought that was a great idea. I thought I'd do the same. So I stopped playing for an entire year. And uh, in my mind, I thought, you know, I could still play. It's a bit of a shock if you've ever had that level of time off. <laughs> and you pick the time, your brain says, I can do this. And then you go, oh, things are not working. But I so got into it. And it was really interesting. I, it coincided with, with um, this realization. I think that it all overlaps that the world did not need another C Ray Vaughan wannabe, particularly not a particularly good one. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't pretend to be Philip Sace or someone, you know. <laughs> um, and, and that really kind of stopped me wanting to play as well, because I hadn't decided what I did want to do with it. Um, and I, I, in the end, I, I was saved by Eddie Van Halen um, a couple of years before he died. Well, several years, because it was only a couple of years before he died. Yeah. Um, it was just odd, actually, because, you know, I was really into classic rock from from the 80s when I first picked up the guitar, but he terrified me. So I never went there when I was younger. But I decided that I, I'm old enough that I don't care anymore, the fear went. And I decided I'm gonna have a complete change of relationship, away from the Steve Ray Vaughan big strings. I went to nines. Of course, having not played for a year, I kind of come down the string gauge, but I decided I would just start from scratch and build a new relationship and be very specific about re-engaging with the guitar with a purely Alexander perspective. And then I started coincidentally getting clients, ads on technique clients who were guitar players, and things started rolling, like, oh, this is interesting. The things I could suggest to them, then find it really useful and start getting a bit of dialogue going. And the next thing I know, you know. Well, I had um, an Alexander technique teacher at university, and he wasn't a guitarist. So it was all very much um, an approximation. You know, it was still alien to him. He was working for the music uni, but it was still alien. That's something that sets you apart and makes you so valuable to us. Someone in the chat was just talking about how their chiropractor is a guitarist. Someone else was saying their ah. massage therapist, their massage therapist specialized in musicians. It's um, so great to have someone who's in the guitar bubble as well, and not just yeah looking in through the window. Oh, it makes it so much easier because we know what we're talking about to each other and. And the thing about the Alexander technique, I mean, he, Alexander's own phrase about his work was dealing with the students of living. Now, a vanilla flavored Alexander teacher, let's just say he isn't a musician, can deal with that on a conceptual level. 
but has never experienced the stimulus that, say, specifically for us, guitar brings. Um, I mean, there's the specifics of the instruments itself. And, but for all musicians, we end up with having this emotional relationship with an instrument that sometimes pulls us in weird directions as well. That, well, that's what I was going to say. So they don't just have the experience of what does a string bend feel like, but they also don't have the experience of here's what the, all the teachers are saying. Here's how that the information and here's the myths in the guitar community. They don't have the communal insights to know, oh, my yeah. God, everyone's saying this and that's wrong. They don't know those perpetuated yeah. things. So that's another thing. Like we have a mountain to climb with the myths. Exactly. There's so much machis- particularly there's so much machismo around playing guitar that, you know, I, I, I sometimes don't know how to address it. People actually want machismo. And, and I used to be guilty of it. You know, I, you know, having been a big Steve Ray Vaughan fan, you know, that machismo, I mean, it's part and parcel, isn't it? But well, eventually yeah, you have yeah. to say... And th- it's beautiful because there are so many paradoxes as well. Like, I want to be, I want pure economy of motion, but then I don't want things to be easy. I want tens. <laughs> and, you know, like... <laughs> I was that person. <laughs> I, Tone is in the hands. I want the best tone, but I won't tune down a half step because that's cheating. And like, oh, my, it's just there's so many. To, oh, what's cheating? What's, um, yeah, what's not allowable? So there's I so think, many things we tell ourselves and each other as players that, frankly, the audience never gives a damn about. And you, you're considering the wrong people when you're having these discussions. If your audience doesn't care, why fight ourselves over this? And we're, we're all guilty. I think. I love that B.B. Uh, King quote when B.B. was telling Billy Gibbons about like eights or nines, or I forget. And he's like, why yeah. are you making life so hard for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> like playing tens. So I think it might be a good idea if we can just hop on to the, a broad definition of what the Alexander Technique is for those that don't know like this, yeah, how you would classify yeah, it. Yeah, sure. So if you ever do meet another Alexander teacher at a party somewhere and he tells you the Alexander teacher, Enjoy asking them what is the Alexander technique. Because you will see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> because it's notoriously difficult to explain. Uh, I, for many years, just was politely say it's a form of embodied um, mindfulness. Which isn't a bad description of the ballpark. Um, you know, it gets you in the ballpark. Alexander said it was dealing with the stimulus of living, which is a really interesting phrase. Um, not the stimulus of life, living. What he's basically saying is stimulus come at us and we behave in various ways that aren't always helpful, that get in the way of our general functioning. We will allow certain circumstances to affect our function. What do I mean by general functioning? We tend to, in the Alexander technique, say use rather than general functioning, but I know that might just sound a bit odd to a lot of people. In the Alexander technique, we, and this, I wouldn't say this is a, an original idea. I think it's an idea that goes back probably centuries and millennia across various cultures and philosophies. Um, but we take it from a pragmatic functional point of view that the human organism, the mind and the body are not merely connected. They're a singular, indivisible entity. If you connect, if the mind and body are things to be connected, they need to be separate. So when people talk about the mind-body connection, they're talking about duality. They're talking about um, Descartes' duality. And Descartes was wrong. He was encouraged to be wrong by the Catholic Church. Um, you know, he wants to see spirit as separate. Um, and, it, you know, Descartes being French, uh, Western thinking, very much took this on board in a way further east they wouldn't have done. So when we talk about a human being, ourselves, we consider, as, as our teachers, not just your physicality and not but your entirety, including your thinking and the quality of your thinking, not the content, not the verbal chit-chat, the quality of your awareness. And we take that as a singular entity, that your thinking and your behavior are one thing, your physical behavior. In fact, your physical behavior is the outer manifestation of your thinking. So what we're really trying to do is just not have our natural functioning as we were evolved to, to enjoy as any other animal species is, whether it's a cat, dog, or giraffe with its long neck, you know, it's perfectly fine, doesn't get neck aches, quite happy. Um, can we keep that going, despite the fact that we've completely changed our environment to one we were not involved? 
And of course, a guitar is one of those things. I mean, a computer is a pretty obvious one. Driving is an obvious one. You know, we get very tense in our behavior. We get stressed and uh, at the keyboard. We follow our gaze into the screen in such ways because we follow our intention. Intention is everything. You know what someone's thinking through their physicality. You know what their intention is from their behavior. And you can see it when people stare at the screen and they're round towards the keyboard because they're, they're so focused on that, they're not considering how they're doing it. And the fact is how they're doing it is actually affecting their general functioning. It may not hurt for a couple of days. <laughs> We're quite strong and resilient, but day in, day out. The same applies to the guitarist. It's the thing that we change our behavior around. We lose our, you know, our burst light or whatever you want to call it. We, are, we adjust and accommodate ourselves and compromise ourselves based on an inanimate object that does nothing. So actually, this um, would be a nice point. We can, we can do a quick plug of the book, actually, because um, a, the, an example you use in the book. Okay, wait. Everyone can look <laughs> at Adrian's screen. There we go. Beautiful cover, Luke. Beautiful. You did, you did a great job. <laughs> So um, the example you gave in the book, I think, is actually re is really helpful for people because I think it's like in the first, in the introduction or something. So you say, I'm, I'm going to paraf paraphrase this. Obviously, this isn't, I haven't memorized it. But you say something like, imagine you're an experienced guitarist and you're doing something that's causing you pain, right? You're, um, something in your left hand, your fretting hand is causing you pain. You might think that, the solution is to change what you're doing. So by that, that might mean you look at the situation and go, right, what wrist angle? What do I need to move my thumb position? Do I need to sit differently and all this kind of stuff, which it could be the case. It could be that there is a mechanical element of that advantage. Yes. 100, yeah. hundred percent. That could be the case, but the added benefit um, that we talk about through the stuff in the book and through Alexander technique about ingraining the mental aspect is, Maybe it's not the actual literal mechanic. It's not the path of the joint, but it's the intention behind it, the level of stress. Absolutely. Or can you, yeah, maybe elaborate that for me? So, what do yeah, you mean by that's the great point. Um, I'm going to slightly quickly backtrack because there's something I didn't say, and I didn't say it purposely, but some of you that know something about the Alexander technique might be surprised I didn't mention the P word posture. Because a lot of people think it's about posture. Now, posture is an element of our you know, natural function. So obviously that is included. I don't want to say it isn't there. I just don't want to focus, focus on it. But what good posture is um, an aspect of is mechanical advantage. What it isn't is a mechanical guarantee. So what goes wrong to, so I'm going to say this in postural aspects rather than guitar aspects for the moment, but it's the same analogy. I'm just more used to saying this. That's all. You can have an idealized perfect posture and it will do you no good whatsoever. If it's rigidly held, and you're trying to hold a position of alignment, you will be stiff and there's no benefit in being stiff. And in time, it hurts. It's tiring, the muscles get tired and the shape itself might be correct. There's no freedom in it. And what we're interested in is the freedom within your posture, your poise. Um, and the same will be true with specifics of power play. And just a thought that's just come into my mind, um, and a point I want to make is there's no point even addressing the guitar specific techniques, mechanical advantages, if you haven't addressed your general functioning first, because your general function will always affect negatively your specific function. So with, by general functioning, you mean your attitude, your everyday life, state of your nervous system, tension? Yeah. yeah. Because well, that's not going to go away just because we give you a guitar. Yeah, exactly. Bring that with exactly. And then you'll, you'll exacerbate. Let's just say, you know, you haven't got the best guitar technique mechanics. You might have got away with that. But because your general functioning is so poor, it exacerbates it further. And, and it all, all breaks down in terms of your guitar technique. It is possible to play guitar very freely with bad technique. You may not be able to play as fast. You may not be able to play as articulately as other players, but you play freely and happily. 
you don't hurt, you enjoy the experience. You might just say, I'm an average guitar player, but at least you're an average guitar player, not in pain. <laughs> because there's a level of freedom with it. Some people have that natural, you know, they're just poised by nature. Some people have natural poise and they bring that to everything they do. So even though they may not have done it, maybe they've just never taken guitar lesson, never had the interest to spend hours and hours of buying guitar specific technique. But at least their general use functioning isn't interfering. So their poor technique isn't going to then develop into something like RSI. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, we've So we've got a lot of practical stuff to do today, right? We've got some things we're going to ask people to do and join in with. Um, I feel terrible because um, I'm just plugging the book in the chat. So I'm going to, instead of just plugging it, I'm going to bring one of those questions into the conversation now, which is someone has just made the comment, don't know about everyone else, but I know I tense up more when I'm playing in front of others. Is that kind of, well, yeah, what are your thoughts on that before we get into the Oh, it's totally normal because that's, there's no bigger stimulus than another, another human being. And there's a guy called Michael Gelb who, who his, his entire sort of niche is working with CEOs doing public speaking because they're faced with an audience and they clam up. It's the same difference. It's stage fright. It's perfectly natural. The, the issue isn't, do you feel the nerves? The issue is, are they out of control that it's affecting your performance? Um, I, I wrote this in the book, and I, I did actually ask John. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with John Don people, fantastic acoustic guitar player and singer. But I saw that, because I follow him on Facebook, I, I, I've been listening to him for years, and I saw him write something years ago, and I just remembered it. I, I was, while I was writing the book, I suddenly had all these memories of things I'd seen. I'd say, oh, look that up again and double check. And I asked John if I could, could use this quote from him. He said, yes. And he basically said, as a paraphrase, that when he feels nervous, and he, he says he's, he's such a terrible surgery, right? Um, when you see how good he is, you'd be like, oh, my God. <laughs> he is human. <laughs> he would actually say those nerves are a kind of a sign of his superpowers coming on board. In fact, if you're not nervous, before a performance, you're probably going to give a bit of a lackluster performance, actually. It's probably going to be a bit bland. So don't be frightened of nerves. They're normal. They can give you some energy. The issue is, do they become so overpowering that it's obviously negatively affecting your playing and every single time, you know, it's not just a one-off, but it's consistently doing so. And what the Alexander technique would look to address with that is to help you recognize what some of the overall behavioral patterns that you're doing in that and work more with the physicality of it than worrying about the psychology of it and sort of backtrack. Because psychology, I think, is so, you know, it's like water through your hands, trying to get hold of your thinking and do something with it, playing mental tricks and games. It, it can be maddening. If you can recognize, you know, the shoulder up, you know, you're pulling like this, you can say to yourself, actually, can I just release my shoulders down? And what we say in the Alexander technique is a bit of a, an old thing. The Alexander teacher is always saying, next three heads forward and up. But if you can let the shoulders release down, just recognize that instead of pulling down here, you want some length up here. It's a nice starting point. It's a barometer in. It's just general behavior. It's not the only thing. Breath's another one. Um, you might notice you're holding your breath. Some breathing little techniques you can do to just release it, and that kicks in your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your resting state. That will just help you manage it. It's a management game rather than an eradication. You don't actually want to eradicate it. It's normal to feel some nerves performing in front of you. Awesome, cool. So, should we um, get started on on what you had planned for today? Sure. So, um, I just thought. I don't know how many people here, this is the first session. And again, impression from some of the little messages that have popped up that it might be. So I'll spend five minutes recapping the last two because the, you need that context. And by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll skip it a bit. I'll, oh, I'll oh yeah, sorry, sorry. So yeah, just, just for context, um, we've done two of these masterclasses before that, uh, and, you're, and you're asking, you don't know how many people have been to those two. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you need to recap those two. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to let everyone know that those two exist. So if you're unsure about, because I've 
kind of gone over it a bit quickly. Um, you can yeah, I imagine it's the first the time context. for most. Okay. You're probably going to have to go back and, and watch them, but at least you'll know what it is you're going back for. <laughs> so the first thing we discovered in the, we talked about in the very first one, yeah, we discussed posture. <laughs> uh, we tried to explain what posture is. The posture is a movement. It's not a position. It's a balancing act. We are very fundamentally wobbly creatures, which is great because the trade-off is mobility for instability or instability for mobility, how you want to say it. The more stable you are, the more less mobility you have. If you want to be stable, be a tortoise. Um, evolutionary, we've gone down incredible mobility. Um, so we are unstable. So we will wobble. So you do not want to have the idea of a fixed position you hold. What you want to do is surf. <laughs> and what you surf, and this is going to be completely counter intuitive for many people, is an up thrust off the floor because gravity isn't pulling you down, it's pushing you up. And I know that's going to throw, throw people <laughs> a bit, but it's general relativity. It's Einstein's general re relativity. Um, you end up with this situation that um, if you were to imagine being on a rocket ship in the, in the middle of nowhere with no gravity or anything, and, that, and you're floating around, if that rocket ship starts accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, which, by the way, is 1G, so gravity is measured in acceleration meters per second squared, and 9.8 is what we're experiencing right now. So that acceleration you experience is coming up underneath you. If that rocket ship you're floating around starts accelerating 9.8 meters per second squared, you orientate yourself so it's, you know, your feet are the rocket's blasters that directly blow your feet, and it's pushing you up. That is indistinguishable from what you're experiencing right now. Indistinguishable. You would not know. You're surfing and up to us. But because we've got all these joints, we're a bit wobbly. So we have to keep refining it. Otherwise, we get toppled over. So we're always moving. Yes, we can do it very skillfully. It may not be that noticeable to some people. To an outside observer, because we're so skillfully wobbling very minutely. I mean, if you look at toddlers, they're very unskilled wobbling all over the place. But the, the job is not to get rid of the wobble. The job is to make it more skilled. So that's how you use your environment to do your posture for you. You don't do good posture any more than a fish does buoyancy. There's a big thing for me at the moment, it's a longer conversation that our behavior needs to be completely in accordance with our environment because there's, there's no such thing as as behavior outside of one's environment. It's meaningless. It's, it hasn't got a functional context. You can't talk about a fish swimming without water. It's meaningless. You can't talk about a fish being functional without water. It's meaningless. You can't talk about human posture without 9.8 meters per second squared of upthrust. It's meaningless. So, that's my posture being done for me. I've been pushed up and I just chill. I ride it. One of the little aspects we, we, from an anatomical point of view, we say in the Amazon technique, why was, I said that phrase, next we head forward and up earlier, is because your spine is, ends up here, higher than most people realize, just under the size of the nose, through that little dent under your earlobes there. That's the top of your spine. Your head sits on top of that. That joint is slightly to the rear. So as you're being pushed up from the underneath, and if I, let's say, that's my nose. And if I exaggerate, if I push up here, I tilt the head like that. So we're designed to have this cantilever. And this is neutral gear. You know, you can move away from it, do other stuff. But at home, where we come back to this balancing act, is such that I naturally get length at the back of my neck, which is why it's useful when you're misusing yourself, as we say, as we get tense and tight, to recognize that we're not pulling back and down, as we say. It's part of, kind of... It's not exactly the startle reflex, but it's the same, the same sort of neural pathways cause that similar behavior. Shoulders go up, neck goes back and down. I'm exaggerating a bit, but you'll recognize this a lot. You'll recognize it when you're, you know, fearful of a situation. And if we can just say no to that and recognize that all I want is just let gravity do its thing, then I'll be less interfered. And then we can have freedom to move, do stuff. 
And those neck muscles are just a really useful barometer in. So we obsess about the head and neck relationship with Arizona technique. It's not the be all end all, um, but it is a big aspect of Arizona technique. Um, you know, it's, you've got to have something practical and useful for teaching methods that people can observe their own behavior of being it, of having it being compromised. And the head and neck relationship is a useful one. Breathing is another good one. Uh, it's just not easy to see in someone else. You can sense it in yourself. So that's the basics of um, posture. Most people, a lot of us, sit when we practice. I don't know about performing. It depends what sort of, you know, if you're an acoustic player, you might perform sat and a jazz guitar is another place sat. Um, you need to recognize that sitting and standing are the same thing. Um, the torso and the spine, the head and the shit. Sitting is standing, um, but it's standing on your bottom. So the, the bony part of your bottom that you can feel, the sit bones, as we call them, they and your hip joints are both below, uh, below the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is basically the base of your spine as it meets the pelvis. That relationship between your pelvic bowl and the spine coming out of it is completely unchanged whether you're sitting or standing. So basically, you don't need to change any of that just because you've changed the weight bearing from going down to the ground to your feet to the underside of your bottom. The only thing that's really changed is you've become more stable. And I do think people struggle a bit with that extra stability. It encourages a bit of fixing. And if you're sat, you are not resting. You're just as dynamic and mobile as when you were standing. Well, not quite as mobile, but in principle, you know, you've still got to adjust and readjust. Find to refine over and over again spontaneously the upper crust. Now, the problem happens when, it's, and it all gets screwed up. It's the moment you go to sit down, you screw up all that, all your poise on the way to the chair. So you arrive screwed up. And then most people don't know how to get out of it. So, how do we not screw ourselves up? Basically, you need to have a clear conception of what going to sit down is. It's basically going to squat and failing. Why fail? So the horizontal surface stops showing any lower. But you very much behave differently when you go to squat. You don't throw yourself at the floor. When you go to squat, you stay in control all the way. So then you arrive and stay in control. It doesn't actually happen, unfortunately, for most people, which is why we use sitting and standing as a great movement metaphor. Um, even just going to a chair, people knowing the chair is there, we do this thing, the term we use is end gaming behavior. The mind treats the chair as a big target, and our mind just goes there. We try to skip in our minds the bit that gets us there. And we end up getting most of the way to share and then popping the rest. The mind just wants to leap forward. So very typically, you know, if I you know, sing fine, yeah, I'll do. You know, I might get someone going and going and then go, oh, and they just pop the last bit. And the way to get around that is as you go to squat towards the chair, you, you break it up, you start by just touching the surface of the chair. And once you've touched, but a lot of people will feel, because they don't have the coordination, will feel unbalanced. You can see them pulling on their neck. You know, people go to sit. You can see them. The first thing they do is they start to go to sit and pull. But that's covered in more, more detail in the earlier video. So to get to your chair, you go to squat. And to start with, if you really break it down, just touch the surface of the chair. And then once you've just touched it, you can then think about weight bearing through it. and then. If you find yourself, you know, you forget, and you just find yourself a bit slumped, or sometimes, you know, you've been sat for a while and your habits take over and you find yourself here a bit. The way out of it isn't to try and find the correct position, but it's to move your way out of it. And the easiest way to do that is you walk your backside over the surface of the chair as if you were stood up, and just refine that sense of being stood and up. And then if you can then keep this and keep a, then add a guitar on top of it, You've got a good basis for free movement because you want to be able to move freely with your instrument. So that's certainly the whole of the first video. The second video, I, I did go into what I call the fly by wire mechanism, which is just the name I stole from the aerospace industry, um, which is recognizing our, that wobbliness. So we went into 
how you can observe your, your, your habit of not falling over. Because you've chosen not to fall over. The point is how you choose to do it. By stiffening up, I'm not going to fall. Or do you guess that I'd be lively with it? I just adjust and readjust. And um, I took here a little exercise that helped you recognize your natural movements, that you want that movement. And, you know, your brain does it for you. But at least it means you know if you're interfering with that or not, if you stiffen. And then I went on to say, you can then play with it. Dance, if you like. Because not only does it keep you mobile, but movement is is tempo. Rhythm is movement. It's not some abstract thing. I know we look at it on a, on a page of music and it's like little markers and this is a stemming point and this is a there. It exists as a physicality of movement, not a mental thing. I, I was very much that way minded. I, mean, I loved maths when I was young, I did engineering. And I would teach, I would, teach, I would tweet, um, Rhythm as a mathematical construct. I remember wondering why my sucks so much. I understood it, but I couldn't feel it because I didn't know what, what it meant to have good time feel. In fact, as a phrase, I used to madden me good time feel. I think it's more of an American phrase than one you hear in the UK. Certainly, when I speak to students of mine who are UK based, not so familiar with that, but you certainly hear it from drummers and bass players. Bass players were more. Good time feel. What does that even mean? Feel time. Well, you don't feel time. What is time other than a, a measure of change? If things aren't changing, there is no time, which is why you can't have absolute zero temperature because it means all the atoms will stop. You can't, you can't have that. It means time will stop. <laughs> so move rate of change is time. We generate ourselves through movement. And if you're doing it on purpose, playing with your line by wire system, I call it, you're generating a groove. And that is a relaxed thing. And if you're then in doing a relaxed thing, expressing tempo, you can take that attitude, that intention, that dance, that performance into playing your instrument. And the nice thing is that you then, if you're practicing that, if that's how you just practice the scale, but generally not losing sight of that tempo and having a little dance, and it could be this big, it could be smaller, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's very individual for each person, how much they, they need to move, to have a sense of time feel. But if you can just keep that going, now I'm nice and loose. If I can just be nice and loose like this, never lose sight of that, just because I've got a guitar in my hand. If I practice that, not only am I practicing being loose and good time feel at home, even just drilling scales, I'm actually practicing performance itself. So I know what I want. People often say, you know, I, I'm great at home, but when I get on stage, everything falls to pieces. But by making both somewhat the same, you've got that continuity. You know where to start. And you start by looking for your, your poise and movement and your time feel through movement. So that was pretty much the first two videos. Um, and if you haven't caught them, Know what to do. <laughs> Go <and find it. laughs> so that's the recap. What I wanted to do today, and it kind of in a way, I mean, loosely, we've kind of semi intentionally um, taken a third of each, the book in thirds, chunks. And this session really needs to be the last chunk of the book, which is. A bit that's got more of the tab, guitar tabbing and stuff, obvious guitar exercises. But they need to have context because it's not really about the guitar exercises. It's whether the guitar exercises screw your general functioning up or not. But at the same time, the guitar exercises are designed to be its building block so you can learn to not screw yourself up with simple, like breaking down to simple things. I mean, you know what it's like, you know, if it's a piece you find hard, it's overload and you immediately find stuff to start. So we do the opposite. We, in the stimulus of living, we make the stimulus smaller and smaller and smaller. So we make very small exercises that might be just one hand at a time and say, 
Can we still not interfere with ourselves? But those same exercises are building blocks to good technique as well. Now, I'm just wondering whether to do a quick breathing one as well. I can't remember, we mentioned breathing last time. I can't remember if let's I did start, the Let's start with breathing, that's fine. Yeah, okay. So, the point of this breathing exercise is there's several points to read. One, it's a great way to first start learning how to calm down your nervous system. Because when we're uptight, we have an uptight nervous system, not just uptight muscles. The muscles are displaying that the outer manifestation of the quality of our nervous system. And basically, if you do long out breath, it kicks in what's known as the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's a nice way just to calm yourself down, to be honest. It's also a nice way to reset your breathing. It's a bit like turning a computer off and back on or any other device to get rid of a glitch in it. So it's not so much you're doing this exercise to get your breathing correct. It's more an exercise in freeing up your breathing so you can forget about it afterwards. But it turns out that trying to do this exercise while you're playing guitar is slightly tricky. And one thing I particularly remember us discussing last time is how in phrasing it sometimes suggested, you know, you phrase with your breathing, like a sax player would. Well, if that's true, they wouldn't invent circuit breathing for that's my concern. <laughs> so we don't have to circular breathe, we can just keep playing. If we want to play a stream of 16th note for break bars, that's our choice. Um, you know, you don't tell the John Paul trains that <laughs> stick more, more pauses in his Play. you know it's, it's an artistic choice one way or another so this idea that you would phrase based around your breathing actually encourages you to interfere with your breathing to interfere with your function which isn't a useful thing to do but what we notice when we do this breathing exercise while we're playing is funny enough it, you'll notice it can screw up your timing that your breathing can your relationship with your breathing screw up your timing so it's a way of trying to free up the breath and it's completely it's a bit like singing and playing to be honest i don't know if i i, I don't sing and play and i have to say I've, my few attempts i find maddening um you know it's very much like trying to drop your tummy and tap your head at the same time um but i've never stuck with it because i never wanted to be a singer but it's similar um and you so just a less of a stimulus when you sit singing on I assume that. But being able to break down the connection between your breathing and your playing. So they're independent of each other. So that what happens is when you get to that difficult passage, you don't go, <gasps> you know how you hold your breath when the difficult part comes up. And of course, the difficult part's even more difficult now. <laughs> and we know we, we know we do that, and yet we think, well, what do I do about it? And one of the things you can do is actually do this exercise while you practice that difficult part. And the exercise is actually very simple. It's just a long out breath. Um, I, I can um, add more detail to it as we go along. There are certain aspects about it that are interesting from um, an Alexander perspective. I'll probably not go into too much detail about that now because I wanted to keep this more guitar at the moment. Some of the the subtleties of human behavior and how the Alexander technique is to address that. Um, and, it, and the Alexander technique addresses these things firstly by observing human behavior. The Alexander technique isn't born out of theory, it's born out of observation. So it's always a truism. You know, we can observe this behavior repeatedly in people. We know it's a typical human behavior. And we just look to see if that behavior is what we would call a misuse. Uh, you know, an interference of functioning. So this, this long out press. Oh, no. So one of the things it does when it resets breathing, it gets your ribcage moving nicely and it allows your diaphragm to properly release. Because it's another muscle, particularly with a bit of stress, it stays tense. And I'm just going to stand up slightly so you can see. The diaphragm's like that. Its job is to pull down like that to create volume allow air to come in, as well as the ribcage coming out. 
And when we're stressed, like any other muscle, it just stays a bit pulled. It doesn't fully release. So we might breathe out and then it just goes there instead of popping back up. So it's like breathing on top of a free breath. You're not getting the full functionality. And the full long out breath really releases the diaphragm. So that's all part of just resetting your breathing. So all you do is you literally just start blowing out. When you can't blow out any more air, you pause for a second or two. You'll feel tension, effort it takes to keep the air out. Just be conscious of that, don't run. Just putting effort into not holding, not in, not letting the air come back. And then release. Now you don't do an in-breath. It's the trigger. You do not do an in-breath. The in-breath does you. You'll be breathed in when you let go of the tension. And that's what you want to allow. You want to allow your in-breath to come without interference. And when you get to the top of the breath, to allow it to turn back around all of its own, you do not need to breathe back out. You will be breathed back out. You do this in your sleep every night. Don't worry, it will come. It will happen. You woke up this morning. It's fine. And then as you get closer and closer, the first few times, if you're not used to this, don't worry about being over the accurate. You'll become more accurate as, as you do it. You need to kind of second guess where you think the outbreath, natural outbreath, would have turned back around into an in-breath. And at that point, you intentionally blow more out, you extend the breath, blow out as much as you can. And just to put your mind at ease, you cannot physically blow out even 50% of your full lung capacity. So when you've blown out all the air you can, it's still slightly more than 50%. You know, the lungs don't collapse. There's still space in there. So if you watch me do it, I'll just blow out. Um, I want to think how to make this look more visible, visual. Do something. So I'm going to blow out. I'll, I'll make it not too loud because you could just do it through your nose. I'll, I'll blow out through my mouth. And then I release and let the air come back in. Now, I didn't do a full cycle because I started talking again. But the breath would have come in. It would eventually turn itself into an out breath. It would come near to the end of the out breath. And then I'd repeat that. Now, if you do that just five times, that's a really great reset of your breathing mechanism. If you want, you can put your hands on your ribcage to feel as you let go how springy the ribcage is. You might notice the first couple of times. That your ribcage is a bit sluggish coming back. But by the third, fourth, fifth time, you might notice it pings out a bit faster. A bit faster. You realize you freed things up a bit. So give that a go. I'm going to keep talking while you do that. Please do it. because I, I want you to get you, it'll calm you down anyway. It's really out. So then, so what that process of calming you down, so while everyone's doing it, we'll, we'll keep talking. That process of calming you down engages the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then the benefit is that is down regulating muscle tension. Yes. And, and yeah, can you go through? Is that uh, the, the big main benefit? Basically, yes. Um, you're calming yourself down. It, it takes us off that heightened state where our behavior tends to be a bit more jargon alert, end gainy. Um, we, we tend to be that doing stuff. You know, uh, and not really paying attention to how we're doing stuff. By like down regulating, we don't just, you know, slow the nervous system down in a way that encourages a release of muscle tension. We change our ability to observe, our ability to be aware of what we're doing in activity. Because when you learn, I mean, in performance, forget about it. You know, you just get on with it. But you're training yourself up to, to strengthen these qualities of the nervous system. But you train yourself. So that when you do practice, you're practicing not in that fast kind of, I've got 10 minutes to practice, I've got to do this, blah, 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 blah. the whole wrong attitude. You need to practice with a kind of a slow mind that takes in information, as well as starting with a, a physicality that isn't tense. So, you know, it's, it's the full picture. It's, it's holistic. Now, basically, on top of that, you can be just do something that you find super interesting on the guitar. And it could be just playing a scale, it could be strumming some chords, doesn't matter. 
That's something easy for you to do. But do this exercise, and this is a nice exercise to do as you prepare. You know, when you first pick up the guitar, and you're going to, let's just say, I'm dedicating the next half hour to a proper practice session. Spend 30 seconds doing this in the beginning. Gear yourself up for constructive practice. So you pick your guitar up. I don't know which one to pick up, but do it. Up. And you find something easy to do, and it could just scale some different strumming chords. It doesn't really matter. But if you do the exercise, what you'll notice at certain parts, and you need to do this exercise to a metronome or drum machine. It must absolutely be in time. Because that's the trick of disassociating your breathing from your playing. So I know we can't, I don't know, if you should have thought this through and maybe what one down, but maybe just take my word for it. Maybe just, it won't work if you just tap your foot because what will happen is you'll change your foot to your breathing and all sorts. You need external. Um, marker of the beat, and you just want to be on it while you do the breathing exercise. And I promise you, you'll find that certain parts of the breathing cycle you'll struggle. Usually, as you release the breath and allow it to come back in, you'll find your timing needs to go a bit screwy. Yeah, I haven't thought that through that we needed an external um, timekeeper to, to make that. Practical from a, a group exercise, um, but do that, and you'll you'll recognise that your breathing is interfering with your timing. And you, you need to learn to dissociate the two, because you want to be freely breathed while you're doing the activity of playing guitar, because you know you you want to be well oxygenated. You also will recognise whether your behaviour is changing through a held breath. That will, if you know your in, your breath being interfered with. You can recognize you're starting to interfere with your general function, which you know is going to affect your specific functioning. So it's an, a nice barometer as well, a window in into behavior and whether you're getting interference or not. The Anasar technique is mostly about um, recognizing interference and, and preventing interference. It's not about doing things correctly. That's a, there's a psychology of getting things correct that is just tense and horrible and now, I've got to get it right. We have a whole culture of being right. Forget about being right. Be free. Recognize interference patterns and learn how to reduce the interference patterns. So, any questions? I see you've got the eyes, eyes on the screen. Actually, yeah, we'll give people a little um, moment to give us questions. Do you want me to have a go at this exercise so people can see it? Yeah, what I'm concerned about you though, is you might be too good. The timing might not go. <laughs> I need a, I need well, a good example of some screen now. <laughs> you, you, could, you could do it and tap your foot and just fake it. Just just mess up the timing and on purpose for us. Um, yeah, I'm quite good at messing up the timing already. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, go on, go. Why not? I don't know. I've never actually performed this with you, have I? So. No, no. So have you, me, uh, have go... you ever done this for yourself? No. Oh, well, probably. Can you hear that? So what it... Yeah. Cool. Talk me through what you want me to do. So grab your guitar. Yep. Find your poise. <laughs> okay, let's uh we'll go wide for this. What... Okay. Let's so we're, we're listening out to see if there's any drift. Okay. And what we might do is if it's obvious you're not drifting to begin with, put the tempo up a bit. Okay. Because it needs to be something you find fairly easy, but you also need to be able to find that sweet spot where you're just done also being challenged a bit in your nervous system. Okay. Yeah, it's overload. Right out there. So if I bring this down, you should be able to hopefully hear the guitar as well.
I don't know if everyone else can hear that. I could hear drift. Yeah, I could definitely feel um a drip like an interruption. Like when I felt like I had to breathe, the notes couldn't happen. <laughs> and they had yeah. to one had to wait for the other to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was I was kinda like I felt like I was doing a tapping my head and exactly. running my stomach. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. But the more you do that and it becomes easier, then you find you just don't interfere with your breath so much when you're when you're playing. But then you can also use it as as a window in a barometer, as I like to call it, of your general functioning. So that maybe you're on stage and you realize, you know, I'm getting all hit up and I can't breathe properly. And you go, all right, I'll do a few long out breaths and, while I'm playing and that'll free me up a bit. And it gives you something tangible to do instead of trying to self talk your way through psycho babble, you know? <laughs> yeah. One of the problems yeah, I have, I have have with a lot of the advice to do stage fright is it's it's all you're overthinking everything already and then you give people more things to overthink you know psychobabble i, I don't actually don't find it that constructive but because That's of fine. psychophysicality kind of like you're, you're too up in your head what i need you to do is imagine yourself relaxing on a beach the way <laughs> <I think. laughs> yes yeah i mean so i've read some that are actually not so bad. There was one sometimes people mentioning colours, just to choose a colour and become aware of it. And it's kind of simple. It's not too in your head. Um, but I still prefer something more psychophysical that plays, plays with that. It gives you something tangible to perform. So you feel you've you scratched that psychological itch of how do I fix something? Well, at least I'm doing something. But the doing something, those long outbreaths, is a parasympathetic nervous system. It's going to calm you down. One of my friends who's an incredible improviser, uh, I asked him, like, what are you thinking about? And he's just like, mm -hmm. just colors and shapes. And like, but he's using that as a exercise of toning down the nervous system, focusing on one thing and yeah, going into that kind of fine. stuff. Cool. Okay. Um, where do you want to go next? Okay. So we did cover this last time. Um, so it's really the exercises that come afterwards, but I'll just quickly mention it again. Um, again, it's something you can do right at the beginning of your practice session, of just dialing in the touch you need. Um, because, you know, we often press too hard. So I, I know we've discovered, we mentioned this last time, but I'm just going to mention it again now. So the thing you need to recognize is you do not need to be pushing the strings on the fretboard. The fretboard is irrelevant. It's very common to try to push the string to the fretboard. Now, if you've got tall frets or an exaggerated uh, string um, example, if you've got scalloped frets like Malmsteen has, if you press too hard, you're basically going to bend the string at you. The string does not need to go any further than the crown. And it's a nice exercise just warming up when you first pick up the guitar, like your practice routine, to do that as well, to dial in your touch. And the exercise is basically, you know, it's not an uncommon one. I've seen it in various places. Um, I know, um, help me out, Luke. Uh, <laughs> he's got a Charvel signature model, um, blue. Um, Charvel. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Rick Graham. Rick Graham. Thank you. The, <laughs> the name just completely went out of my mind. Right? Yes, I've certainly seen Rick Graham promote this, and um, I heartily agree with it. Um, and if you've seen Rick play, it's frightening. Very, very good technique. But you basically touch, and I'm going to coincidentally choose my low E string. You touch all the strings, I don't know how visible that is, without displacing the strings. And you want one finger per fret. And the, the trick is to push a string, sorry, the string with one finger, to the crown of the fret while keeping the other fingers quiet. If you've ever seen a trumpet player playing and he pushes one down, the other things have to stay pressed against the, un, the keys he's not pressing down. It's kind of like that. So you press one down, but all the other fingers stay there. So you push down 
and you do one finger at a time. And the thing is, you want to let the string push your finger back up again to meet the others. Now, on a good day, I can do this quite well. Actually, in front of the camera, in front of everyone, I'm finding it harder. It's a big stimulus for me. <laughs> so I'm going to have to pay attention. So I'm going to start with this finger. I push down, leave the other fingers where they are, and then release to bring back up. Then my second finger, then my third finger, and my fourth finger. And, you know, you can pick up some speed with it once you get used to it. But it's just dialing that in, that touch. So you're starting with a sense of, of ease. Like you're not just grabbing like a baseball bat, mashing your fingers into the fret. Can, can you quickly show us what most people might do with the fin fingers flailing a little bit? So what we're not trying to do? Well, what we, one thing we don't want is that. Um, so if I push down, I don't want the other fingers to come up. And you will find, I mean, on a, on a good day when I do this, I can keep my other fingers quite quiet. This isn't one of those days. They are actually wobbling a little bit. I so, yeah, when, when you say quiet, more you mean stationary. Actually, stationary, yeah. The more I do it here, the better I'm getting at it. Yeah, or not. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, it's, it's one of those exercises I, I did loads like a few years back. And I rarely do now, but I did actually do it the other week for some reason. I was quite pleased with my result. Um, today I'm less pleased, but have to say, but never mind. <laughs> um, but it can be a really nice way to start a practice session. Just doing that, uh, I'm back to being okay. I think it might be because of where I'm angling the guitar and stuff out of position, but mechanically disadvantageous. So first finger release, second finger down release, third finger down release, fourth finger down release. It's just a nice touch. There are reverse versions of that if you're unsure, if you're, you know, let's say, say you take a chord mm. and you will know if you're mashing your fingers or not. So just take the like C chord, just take the C. Can I start releasing your R? All right, now it's buzzing. Right, I just, so you, if you think you're typically heavy handed, you can do it in reverse as well. Play your notes you think you're normally with, then start releasing pressure. So you start hearing the buzz. So you go, oh, I need just a little more than that. Both are useful, given context, um, both addressing the same thing. So that's a nice thing to do as well. Just, you know, we're talking one minute, two minute. When you first pick up your guitar, when you dedicate a half hour practice session, just to dial in some qualities through the breath work and through that little exercise. Go, all right, let's set myself up. Now, the exercise I'm about to show you, and they're in the book, and they are tab, and they look like fairly standard kind of exercises in a way. But the purpose of the exercises from our design perspective isn't the exercise itself. It's does the exercise take you away from yourself from the general function? That's the real trick. That's really what makes the exercise powerful. Not can you physically do it as written, I don't care how it's physically written. And yes, maybe you can get the notes out as they're written. I'm interested in the experience you're having. I want to know that while you're doing those exercises, you're not losing sight of your general function, your freedom, your poise. Now, when you're doing them at home, in the practice room, without anyone there, it's much easier. Doing it in front of another person is another matter. <laughs> so I have a um, student, she's actually a violin, but she was talking to me the other week how she was struggling in her her violin lessons because she was kind of basically getting stage fright in front of her teacher. And I got her to talk to him and explain this is what we're doing. That's what we're doing in our exam techniques. So if she stops rending and, and reason and and um, resets herself, we find a poison in he knows why. It's not necessarily because she's necessarily finding the piece itself not possible to play. It's that she didn't find it possible to play without interfering with herself. And, and being really you know, adamant that that's important. That's part of what good, and you can't say someone's got a good technique if it's, if it's destroying their general function, because if it is, later down the line, 
when someone says oh, I was stopping and got RSI, I went, no, you didn't. I spent the last five years getting RSI. Then it just started hurting you now. <laughs> it didn't happen overnight. You practiced getting RSI. So we're going to break down the left and right hand separately. And I think it's a very useful thing to do for various reasons. Um, practicing scales on their own, even from a pure technique point of view, can be overload to your learning. So, you know, you want to get better, better at fast picking, let's say, or alternate picking, and people will give you a scale to do. Well, the moment you give someone a scale to do, you're traversing strings. The moment you traverse strings, you really up the ante of the difficulty of what makes picking hard. What makes picking hard is going from string to string. Picking on one string is not so hard. To start with just one string. I, I think one of the reasons at, um, someone like Mounsting and, and many metal players who chug away in the low E strings, they're playing one string and it's the thick one. It's kind of difficult to pick a thick string. They get good on that rhythm playing. And then you wonder why they get punched so easily in the rest of it. The lead playing. Uh, but someone like Mounsting, he very much does that pattern sequences along a string. I think that's encouraged him to have because it's easier to do, because he, he basically gone out of his way to practice something that's easier. And then I can use the word loosely, fudged how he straight changes strings, because changing strings is awkward. So on the, when he descends, he doesn't pick every note. He fudges it. I say that, but it sounds like a criticism. It's not intended to be. It's a perfectly valid thing to do. But it, it, it puts, takes down the stress on his on his right hand, but he's, while he's on one string, wow, can he, he pick away fast? Because he's practiced that a lot on one string. Now we're gonna start with just the left. And bear in mind this whole, whole idea that you only need to take the strings to crown the thread. We're gonna basically be doing hammer-ons from nowhere. But it's a great way to build coordination of the left hand and a bit of strength. Um, but you need strength through coordination. You don't want strength to strength sake because you can actually strength malcoordination just by, you know, people doing and they just mash their fingers. In the so this is something you might be not familiar with doing, particularly descending, hammering a note. Because normally we hammer on, we keep the fingers on, and then we probably pull. But that's what most people do. Now, I'm not suggesting for you shouldn't do that. And I'm not suggesting what I'm about to show you is how you should play. I'm saying it's a really useful exercise for various reasons. There is, there are some of you, you interviewed someone who, who plays purposely with all hammer-ons. Who, who was that? Well, there's a few people. Um, Brett Garstead does it a little bit. That might have been the guy. Josh Adam Holsworth has got this. Oh, I didn't know that. That doesn't surprise me looking at his, his left-hand form. It really teaches you to have have um, rhythm in your left hand. Because most people associate rhythm with their right and hope their left hand can keep up. But if by teaching both hands to have independent sense of rhythm, it's then much easier to synchronize. That's one of the reasons we do this. Um, yeah, there was someone in particular interviewed. I'm trying to think who it was. It wasn't someone I was familiar with. Um, you can't remember either. <laughs> No, well, no. Um, Tom Quayle talks about practicing it. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll keep thinking about it. To play that way. It's part of his style to actually play that way, not just being practiced. That's just physical. When was this at the last summit? Or the no, last no, no, it wasn't actually part of the summit. It was, a, it was a, I think it was just a, a standalone. Oh, memory. Marshall Harrison. Probably. Yeah, Marshall Harrison. Yeah, yeah. It would have been him. So it is an option. To actually use it as a as a playing style, but that's not particularly why I'm suggesting it. I'm suggesting it as a way of getting good coordination. So obviously the possibilities of fingering are fairly endless, but there are some very standard basic places to start that will serve you know 99% of your playing. And that is you have either fingers one to three. One, two, and four, or one, three, and four. 
And with the one, two, and four, you can either do it with a semitone between those two fingers or a tone. And that's basically all the parameters. That's going to take you through a large part of, of your playing repertoire. You know, until you start getting to particular wide stretches and stuff. Um, you know, if you like to play three notes, string, and tonics, for example. But I'm not going to cover that. Well, for a start, is it starts upping the stimulus too much. So what we want is this ability to, I uh, know I can, I can hear from both, but I hope you can hear that. Now, bear in mind, these strings are pretty old, so they're not ringing particularly through, but. So you can just go up and down, and you can do it with one, two, three. You can do it one, two, four. One, sorry, that was one, three, four. One, two, four. Or stretch. Now that's just up and down, but I, I provide them with some sequences to practice it. So something like, uh, ooh. and it's I about. I can't hear speed. that very well. Um, Sorry. Let, let me have a go. Oh, was, it, was it just like. I can't hear that very well. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. We made it um, work. <laughs> yeah. And now, there's various different examples, like different patterns you can come up with. Um, there was that's in fours. Uh, no, that's in threes. So, can you hear now? Because yeah, I've got another headphones. And, and in the opposite way. And you can do it with each finger and you can do it across the fretboard. But while you're doing it, you can, again, do it to, to um, a rhythm. If you want, you could do the breathing exercise with it, the breathing vine. <laughs> but it gets, the, it really gets those fingers coordinated well. And unreliance on this hand also means, you know, sometimes we, we fluff it a bit and we're, it, it means if you've got a good solid right hand, you don't have to, sorry, left hand, if you don't happen to, if you miss with a pick, the note still comes out anyway. <laughs> and in fact, in certain circumstances, someone like um, Tony McAlpine, he'll, if he's doing a, a sweep arpeggio, he only sweeps in one direction. He does a, a down sweep, and then when he comes back up, he doesn't bother using the pick, he just hammers back up. It's dependent on, you know, style of music, how much gain you've got. I and mean, it's not something I'll do much on an acoustic, to be honest. I think you're a little more reliant on uh, on the pick on an acoustic, because that's not, you know, if you play bluegrass or something. Um, but just simplifying that, go, can I do this? Get these fingers coordinated. But remember, all the time, what you don't want is to be doing this. I'm going, <laughs> you want to, by keeping poised. In fact, keeping your dance. So if I go, keep that going. I'm nicely poised. I'm moving with the beat. I'm grooving. Have my own little groove. I'm building the groove that I build in my movements expresses through the playing. So my fingers feel what I'm doing. They're in tandem as a general groove. A sense of dancing, a lightness, not effort. And it's about speed of bringing the string down, not strength, but speed of bringing the string down to the crown of the fret. And people will find it weird descending all hammers. That ability, particularly the first finger, I'm not used to that. That's just a fantastic way to warm up your hands, to get good coordination, and as a low level stimulus to say, can I even do that without screwing up my coordination, my general piece of coordination? I mean, something, um, is it Jake who mentioned that the last, um, the last one of these we did, he, he points out, and I'm sure many of you will recognize that, even the act of looking at your guitar before you put it around you, makes your shoulders cut, you can kind of feel yourself, wrap yourself around the instrument. Just by looking at it, that association. Can you stay completely neutral? I'm here with my voice. I then stick 
power here. I'm here with my paws. I'm completely unaffected by this. It's just there. I'm still completely the boss. It's not the boss of me. And then can I just go? To... Yeah, that would help if I am actually <laughs> got the press either. And be completely with any combination. So that's that one. I think I put a few different sequences in there, and obviously you can do it across uh, the string set. And then one thing I, I I really like to do with that is once you've got it going, is bring the right hand in and try not to change the volume. Now I'm not suggesting you can't create extra dynamics with a pit that it could be louder. But many people have a right hand tension that's, um, I'm a lefty playing right, hand, right handed. So this is a bit of a, a problem area for me. Um, I will start, I, at school, I was made to write my right hand, even though I'm left handed. So I have terrible writer's friends and all that stuff. So this has been really useful for me personally um, to be able to do that. Oops, sorry. Now I'm picking, now I'm not. Keep them at the same volume. Anthony Harrison to everyone. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so bring in the right hand and then take it out and keep the same volume. That's your medium level of picking. You can pick harder, of course. The, the interesting thing isn't should or you shouldn't. It's more of a problem if you can't do that because you're always heavy handed. If you can keep but the other thing is, if you can do that, it means you've got some headroom in your dynamics. So you've got a base level with your left and right hand that says, this is my base level of dynamics. And of course, you can go quieter and you can go louder. But if you can do that right, that left hand hammer on, and then add articulation with the pick without necessarily volume. Yeah, you know, basically with an electric guitar. Yeah, I'm just doing the volume for you. You know, you don't need to keep picking louder isn't going to make the audience hear you anymore. <laughs> you're you're absolutely either delivering or it isn't. Um, so really, and there's an argument to be said with the right hand for the picking that it's more about dynamics and articulation and volume. I mean, that argument starts to break down a bit with the acoustic guitar, but you, you get the point. Um, questions. We actually have um, a question, which is not on that subject, but I want to make sure I don't miss it. So, how bad is he a heavy guitar pulling on your shoulder? My favorite electrics are eight plus pounds, and definitely seem to tie me out. Yeah, uh, it, obviously it's an issue. Um, eight doesn't seem that heavy. Eight pounds doesn't seem that heavy. But, um, you know, we're all different builds. So fair enough. Um, and this can be the length of time. Yeah, it can be an issue. Um, all I can suggest is common sense. And you've only really got two options of common sense. You get a lighter guitar or you get a wider strap. <laughs> um, and you, there are straps. I mean, it depends how far you want to go with it. I... Which kind of, I for Christmas, um, just because I was looking for Christmas presents for people by me, it's quite a nice, it's a memory foam kind of material, and it's a reasonably wide strap. Um, and I do, but I mean, to be honest, it's not that heavy, but it grew anyway. But it is, really, this is really kind of, and there are companies doing this. One I, I'm seeing on Facebook adverts all the time at the moment, I think it's called like a zero gravity, they call it, it's like a zero gravity strap. Um, so not just the width, sometimes the material itself can be nice. I mean, this was kind of like a memory foam. It's nice. So common sense, what can you do? You can either have a lighter guitar and or you can have a much wider and softer strap. There are, I mean, I've never seen, I've never tried one, but you can get these straps where it goes over both shoulders. Yep. And um, would a stretchier strap help? So he says, I'm going to try out a stretchy one. I've heard they distribute the weight well along your back. Um, 
What do you mean by I mean, this, this memory foam, I guess, is a bit stretchy. I, I don't know if that's what you mean, but yeah. Um, but it certainly molds a bit better. It doesn't dig in. Um, and this one was by Picasso. It was quite cheap, actually. Um, if I'm an Amazon. Picasso strap up the value for money. I think it's great, really. Um, yeah. Awesome, cool. Um, yeah, well, we'll keep going. I think that's it for questions. Let me just have a quick sip. I could. I, could uh, I won't endorse. Cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I almost feel like having a sneaky look and reminding us. <laughs> 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 What did I say? What did I talk about? Oh, you're right. Yeah. So, um, just taking that idea, you can also do it on one string, but eventually you want to take it to full scale. So, so whether it's a straight scale or various patterns, um, thirds, that's in thirds or, um, or triplets. That sort of idea. So there were just cut some example examples of, of building up one string, so then doing some some patterns, full scale, but also patterns within the scale. Certain patterns don't work as well as others, particularly because of the way the beans G string are tuned. You sometimes end up with a bar, and this this idea basically doesn't work um, when you have a, a mini bar anywhere. You know, when you have to roll finger. I think someone mentioned to me. Um, Richardson, that guy's name. I'm not familiar with all the, the new shredders, but um, Richardson, very good shredder. But apparently, he's organized all his um, arpeggios so that he never ends up with a bar. So he could effectively do this technique with everything. Um, I don't know, it's a choice. Um, it means you always have that rhythmic feel in your left hand even when you're playing arpeggios. Because that rhythmic feel, Thank you, Jason Richardson. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't have to be organized. I all my play to avoid bars. Um, but just if you're practicing this exercise, there are certain things you can't do. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned I'll bet you. So I've got a oh, question. That, um, so that, that's just a, a two and a, a five and a one, I'll bet you. Uh, yeah, you can just go back and forth. Got a great question here. Do you have any experience with ergonomic guitars like Strandberg? Um, in the book, do you discuss seat height, classical seating, less leg rests? Um, yeah. Okay. So wait. So there, there's a chapter on ergonomics in the book, but that and you also that's also one where you talk about uh, seating as well. Let's just address the first part. Do you have any experience with Strandberg guitars, and what's your opinion on ergonomic guitars? I'm going to answer the second part of that question first. So let's go with the second part of that question first. In the um, book, <laughs> do you discuss on. seat height, classical seating, leg rests? Oh, no, that wasn't what I meant by the second part of the question. Um, I didn't particularly um, in that sort of detail um, because it depends. What I basically said was wherever your guitar is in practice, it needs to be where it is in performance. And then you've got to think about that. Now, for me, for the longest time, put rest and play classical style. That's what I've been doing for years. Now, admittedly, I started on classical style, so it felt perfectly natural for me to do that. Does that mean I think you should always play like this? Well, what if you play sat down like this, either as an electric or acoustic player, but you always play sat down? You can do it like this as well, because in the classical guitar world, women, because of skirts, who traditionally basically encourage to put the guitar on their right leg in a more casual style. And you can do them any arm. <laughs> Being is consistent. If you play guitar on the right leg, you raise the right leg, fine, so be it. But do you play the guitar stood up with it there? Or when you play, is it over here? Well, if it's over here, when you I stood up, you want it to be there when you sat down as well. So that's the consideration. Be consistent between the two. 
Great. So then, um, should we talk about Rambo. ergonomic guitars? Okay. Uh, I mean, so, in yeah, cool. Go for it. Okay. So, oh, and just I just want to finish off. I said for years I used the footstool. I just decided, partly because I was looking for Christmas presents for myself, and I got this strap to actually make a point of having the strap on. My initial plan was to have the strap so it was just so, and it kind of is. I could stand. I could have the footstool there. But this we just hold it in place as well so it doesn't go anywhere. I actually just don't bother with the footstool anymore. I just play sat with the strap and it's just there. So when I and I actually think this is probably the best solution for several. I mean, not if your guitar's really heavy, but it means I'm mobile, I can move, I know it moves with me, I don't have to worry about it knocking off. So these days I tend to not bother with the footstool so much. That's a recent thing. Um, I just feel more mobile, you know, if I'm moving around. I'm, Worry about slipping. Um, yeah, ergonomics. Interesting thing about ergonomics, multi billion pound industry, and there's not a shred of science to back it up. So, there you're talking about uh, ergonomic chairs and things like that. All of it. Really, when it comes to ergonomics, it's about being not unergonomic. <laughs> Is it at least functional? Now, there's no such thing as an ergonomic chair because this stool here is an ergonomic stool. Why? Because my thumb is supported by it, which is all it needs to do because I've stood up on my bottom. I don't need a chair to do anything else. What's the purpose? Once you've got a surface, what's the rest of it doing? Nothing. And it won't necessarily change your behavior. That's going to be an interesting thing I'm going to come back to. There's a context that. Sometimes that's not true. Um, yeah, ergonomic chairs and all that, and all sorts of things, as long as it's not unergonomic. Now, with guitars, what would an unergonomic guitar be? Well, for me, anything that's got neckties. So I did sell a, a Tele Deluxe years ago with a big 70s style, strat style headstock in it. It was a funky guitar, man. I liked it, but I got fed up having to hold it up. Because of necktie. So anything with necktie, I would consider unergonomic. But basic functioning, you know, a strat is as honestly as ergonomic as any guitar needs to ever be. You know, well, do, so do, do we really do we really think Manson's gonna suddenly start playing better because he's playing a strand though? No. If and here's the other color. If every if Strandberg was the only guitar in the world, do I think RSI would go out and win? Oh I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kicker. Now, have I personally tried a strand book? Yes, I have. Um, it's not a guitar I'm carrying. Um, I have a, a love-hate relationship with strand books. Um, I tried one. I, re I think they, I really like the aesthetic of them from a modern design view. I really like actually the way they're designed to sit stable in position. The endure neck thing I couldn't care less about. But that's an, the endure neck, I think, is, is interesting from a psychological point of view. So an ergonomic chair doesn't work because it can't do anything for you. It's an animal object. You do the sitting, not the chair. So I'm sat in the piano stool. It's as ergonomic as anything ever needs to be from a chair. But of course, you're never invested emotionally and interested in the thing you're sat on, and you pay it no attention. So while you're ignoring your chair, hoping it's going to do good sitting for you. And it obviously can't. The same isn't quite true of a guitar. So you see the endure neck, you think, oh, it encourages my neck to be, my thumb to be along, along this line. Well, you can do that without that being there. Of course, it encourages you to think about it. But you don't need it. I've got nothing against it. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I go through phases, and I'm going through one at the moment where if money was just dropped in my lap, I go, I really want to try one. I really want to buy one. <laughs> so I have this weird thing where I think the whole ergonomics argument for them is totally overblown. But at the same time, there's all sorts of things I quite like about them. There's a nice aesthetic about them. I do like the fact that they're, they're lightweight and balanced well. I like good balance is important. The endure neck thing, I'm, we, we, we've well, managed to go for a long time. And I don't think simply having endure neck is going to suddenly stop people from, from getting RSI. So am I right in thinking there's kind of a 
a miss, a false advertising claim in ergonomics in that um, ergonomics is like a sense of optimizing it. Uh, let me, I'm going to use this in the way they would phrase it. We, we don't have to dissect how wrong this is, but like, <laughs> optimizing, it for the sh optimizing it for the shape of the human body. But that still doesn't mean it is corrective in any way. No. It's not going to, if your problem not changing is... Behavior. Not changing exactly. behavior. It's not going to make but you less tense. No, exactly. And, and the, the endure that thing isn't going to make you play any less tense. It is going to encourage you to have your thumb on the back more, but to be honest, is that the, is having your thumb in the right place on the back of the neck the be all end of what's causing RSI in the first place? I don't think so. Um, it's possible to do all sorts of things with your thumb wrapped around. Even legato and stuff. I mean, well, not white I'm, I'm sure. We've all uh, played acoustic guitars with thick strings and high action where your thumb hurts after a few, couple of bar chords. Mm. Like, so what does having your thumb on the... That, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like it's not going to do work for you. Um, no. So Anthony here said, for RSI, what symptoms do we look for instead of just kind of cutting your practice session short, you know, to be extra safe? What should they be thinking about? Playing through tiredness, even before it starts hurting. If Are we talking like mus game, muscle tiredness? Yeah, 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 yeah. Naturally, in fairness, if you're really tired, just it's not. It, if you're really, what I find is if I'm really tired, and I can tell because you know, practice sessions are not worth waiting, waiting paper. Um, I might actually still do the loo rounds for five minutes just to keep Gallus in there, but I'll realize that it's not productive. But when you're mentally tired, you're not on top of your physical game either. And you're likely to play through without recognizing that you're physically getting tired. So, and tiredness, you know, physical and mental tiredness are closely linked. Um, but let's just say you're on it, you know, you're awake, and you're Loads of energy. Let's put it this way. How many songs do you know that are an hour long and a stream of 16th notes? Well, I, so why you my album? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought, I'm going to go. There's a gap between the tracks. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> You know what? Yeah, exactly. So um, we we can be guilty. I'm going to drill, you know, some scales and stuff. Well, well, don't do it for longer than three to five minutes ago, because even one song is unlikely to ever have three to five minutes worth of sixteenth notes. So even without actually feeling anything, just be sensible. Just go. I'm going to drill this for three minutes, and then I'm going to pause. Or, you know, you may be going along, you might be purposely working on your insurance, but go, all right, I can feel the burn now. Yeah, now stop. Because it's like, having a strain injury is what you do to yourself at the end of the day. No inanimate object gives anyone a competitive strain injury. No computer keyboard can do anyone any harm. Just can't. Inanimate object, it's task the same. So you're just really recognizing when you feel in yourself you're tiring and not to push through the tiredness. And of course, when you do feel that tiredness, there's all sorts of other little things you can do. You don't have to just stop playing. You could do the touch exercise again, gently. You could do the breathing exercise and just take a moment. You know, you don't have to stop practicing. But, you know, don't get caught up in that. I'm practicing my 16th notes for the next hour <laughs> and do it doggedly as if because I've said I'm doing it for an hour, I'm damn well going to do it for an hour. Because the more tired you get, you do it, your coordination's going to get worse and worse. The hiding's are nothing. But it's learning to listen to yourself. The Amazon tech is a lot about learning to listen to yourself, to hear signals. That's why when I said earlier, about the breathing thing, it, you know, when we start to downregulate, one of the things that downregulation helps with is to make better observations. When you're quiet, there's a quiet awareness. 
so that when you can feel tiredness building up, lactic acid, you don't just plow through it. Awesome. I think um, we've just got a couple more minutes here, if, if you're good for them. Um, I've only got a couple more minutes. But um, I would like to ask, what does integration of the Alexander technique look like? What would that look like for most of us um, for a practice session? From what we've said here, I'm kind of guessing it's like start with an initial it would be nice if we could start with an initial Alexander technique exercise for awareness, whether it's that scale thing or the breathing thing. And then is it about as you go through your exercises, just you, you do what you do and then you occasionally take yourself out of it and then yeah. evaluate yourself and then go back. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what I do. Um, I'm not in a particularly guitar intensive period at the moment, coincidentally. So I'm not doing a great deal of practice right now. Um, but when I am in that mode where I'm, I'm being um, inspired to, to knuckle down, this is what I do. I start by lying down for 10 or 15 minutes. So we haven't discussed any super on lying down or constructive rest or whatever you want to call it. I prefer constructive rest. Um, it's in the book, but it's a, it's a constructive way of lying down on your back, um, knees up towards the ceiling, feet flat on the floor uh, with your book with a book or something under your head, just to raise your head off the floor a bit. Because if your head's against the floor, it, it's not your natural posture, it's a bit of a strain, it's flat, because there's a natural curvature to the spine. And you basically lie there, and you can do some of the breathing exercises, you know, I showed you while you're down there. So just to really kind of quieten yourself down in 15 minutes, get rid of any tiredness within, you know, the muscles of your torso, and just really downregulate. Undo some of the ills of the day that might build up to a bit of tense. And then I'll take that, I'll sit down with the guitar, and I'll try and maintain a sense of being down regulated and do, you know, just touching and I'll do all those things. But I'll probably only spend two to three minutes doing that once I've got the guitar in my hands. And then I Kind of just try to keep it in mind, those qualities in mind that I'm aiming for, and work on whatever it is that way. If I notice along the way, now I've been doing this a long time as an Amazon teacher, I tend to notice when things build up in me. So I get the little tap on my shoulder that says, uh oh, time to stop. If you're not so tuned into yourself, it might be a good idea just to actually time yourself every five, 10 minutes. Maybe put a time of 10, 10 minutes and then reassess. But basically, as, as you said it, yeah, and, and go and come back and forth through it. Awesome. Uh, we've got one last question from Eric. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Eric, for tuning in. Um, I guess my final question would be if I have an acute RSI, how much should I play? Or should I stop entirely for a couple of weeks? Things start to flare up after five or ten minutes of playing. I would stop completely for a couple of weeks first. And then come back to it. The first week, only doing your touch exercises. I would come back to it with a completely, just because basically, Every time you approach the guitar, you're approaching the guitar the way you've always approached the guitar. And you need to build a new relationship because what you can't do is what you were doing before and get different results. Different results you're after is the lack of things. So you basically need to start from scratch. Now you're not entirely starting from scratch because obviously you know fretboard geometry, you know where things are, you know, it's familiarity. But give some time to heal. And then when you come back to it, come back to it gently. Start with just the touch exercise. Just start with that. Always looking to see if you can maintain your poise throughout and all the other exercises that are in the book. And build into it gently. So it's kind of like, it's not just a case of rest. It's, the, the fact is that the problem was the thing 
resting isn't going to change the fact that it's still the no. thing when you come back to it. Exactly. Yeah, you it's, to, it's what you're we, doing with while you're playing guitar that needs to be addressed. The rest is, is neither here nor there, actually. An, an argument could, I, I did, the back of my mind, there's a part of me that sort of said, I could say, you don't need to rest. You just need to not put, it will heal anyway if you don't put under your temp pressure on it in the first place. And how can you do that? Well, not doing what you're currently doing, which is play the way you do. So step back and go right back to the beginning. Start with the touch exercises, for example. And start with assessing that you know what poise is, that you recognize what interference is, whether you're holding your breath, whether you're, you know, your, your balance and poise is getting, getting um, affected. You know, if you feel your neck muscles and shoulder muscles tightening. Starting to recognize all those tension habits right from the beginning. And what you, when you work on playing guitar, you're working on not interfering with yourself. Work on that rather than working on the guitar, which is the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously are still working on the guitar. It's, it's a different mindset. The thing is, guitar is an animal object. You don't learn the guitar. You should have no interest in learning the guitar. Your interest should be in learning yourself. You are the instrument. It's you that you're learning to play around this inanimate object. Awesome. So two things before we go. Uh, we, from Adrian and myself, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you for all this interaction in the chat. That's been wonderful. And thank you to everyone who's um, bought the book as well. The second thing, Adrian, keeping in touch with you and things like that. Have you got your Facebook group set up? Because it's going to be like dedicated to stuff. I do. I do. I do. Um, oh, so book. I have an easy. I have an easy way people can get to it. <laughs> if you I'm go to checking. Amazon yes. to the book, it, it's not in your copy. If you go to Amazon to the book and you open the KDP one, you can look inside. In there, there's a QR code, and that will take you redirect you to um, the Facebook group. The Facebook group is about like this: the, answering the, these questions. The, the, the group's name is fairly obvious, so you hopefully find it anyway with a search. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so if you get into the just go join the group and you can ask Adrian all your questions and you can share your experience because even the, the community side of it is huge. Like people in the chat have just shared guitar straps and um, and yeah, we've all got insights into that, um, uh, well, from the people in the chat. So thank you. And uh, Adrian, thank and then, you, you know, for... I, just to, to add to that, I've written stuff off the top of my head in the book that I find useful and my pupils have found useful. I haven't necessarily written about every possible thing that could possibly be, but I probably will have an opinion on it anyway. <laughs> so if, if that happens to be the case, that you'll read the book and go, I've got, still got this question. Just ask me. And then we can uh, use that for version two and we can update it. So, <laughs> um, perfect. <laughs> Guys. Thank you so much. If you're stateside, have a great day. If you're over here in Europe, good night. Have a good evening. Adrian, thank you again. It's been a pleasure working with you and best thank of luck with you. the book. Thank you so much for this incredible thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lucian, thank you. Arpit, thank you. Eric, Tiago, thank you all. Roxy, thank you. And yeah, everyone who bought the Tim book as well and your kind words on that. Guys, you have my email if you need me. You know how to get in touch with Adrian if you need him, that QR code in his Facebook group. We will uh, speak to you all soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>